the recovery church. Just seeing if we're getting on live here on Facebook. So, uh, good evening, and welcome to Recovery Church. Different. 
God wants to give us. We need His love. Because what we really need is what God wants to give you. all about God's love in our life. You know, I, I there's a song I wrote, and it's so recovery-minded because we can look at people struggling on the street, and we have like this thing in recovery, we talk about it, a built-in forgetter. And we forget what it was like when we were that person on that street, or that person that had acting like they were, you know, had had mental illness in their life. And, you know, we get good, we get religious, and then we get good and religious. And that's my prayer tonight, that Lord, that we would not become good and religious, Lord, but that we would become lovers of people in the way that you are, God. You know, God has a plan for you. I don't know where you're at tonight, you know, in your life, but God has a plan. And, and what we like to do at Recovery Church is, is share some hope, some experience, strength, the hope of what Jesus Christ has done in our life and brought us out of the gutter, out of the places that we've been. Um, so, Lord, uh, be with us tonight, Lord. And, uh, Guide us and direct us, watch over us, comfort us, Lord, and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. song and then I, I want to get into this teaching on the uh, eighth step. 
tonight. You know, I was listening to Keith Noor at Calvary Chapel this morning, and he was talking about the power of trials and how it strengthens us. And my whole philosophy on trials is it reveals God more and more and more in our lives and what's going on and what we're doing. We see the power of God because we see God taking us through trials. And there's this guy named Crowder, and he wrote, he wrote maybe he redid this song. Um, he might have wrote it. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a song I think the addict, the alcoholic, the sinner can identify with. Because sometimes our sins take us to some pretty dark places. And um, it's called um, All My Hope. Because the lyrics are, All My Hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven and I've been washed by the blood. And we need to remember that. You know, we can go on in our life and, you know, those times where we go through struggles, my question is, where is Jesus in your life at that time? And we need to remember that. And I'm so grateful to God that, you know, he took me out of a really crazy life years ago. And he's been working on me and I'm just so grateful to God. Savior, I've fire from above. I've been down to the river, ain't saved. Prodigal.
So uh, good evening, and um, we want to talk about the eight step. And a lot of people would, like a big church choir would say, ooh, I got to make a list of all the people I have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. I heard this in recovery a long time ago. We're only as sick as our deepest secret. Secrets have a way of, of really choking us out in life. And we need to let that stuff go. You know? For me, it was tough in some parts. I had, I had to go to my kids and make amends to them because I was that absent, drunken, high-as-a-kite dad. You know, and I found out after a while, too, being a new creation in Christ is a way that I make amends to my family and society. You know, being there for my family when they need me and my friends and, and the, those I love in recovery um, is just amazing. I have a little announcement. I'll, I'll, I'm going to get I'll get in back to the eighth step next week. I'm going to and you're welcome to come with me. <laughs> no, I'm going to be back at um, Montauk Avenue. We're going to open the building back up. We are on uh, COVID protocol. We're going to ask people to wear masks inside the building when they're there, you know, when they sit down, you know, but it, use good judgment because I'm not speaking from a guy that that read a book on COVID-19. God has healed me. I, I'm negative for the virus now. Praise him. I am just praising God. And so I thought about, you know, because one one report I read was that, well, if you've had it, you can't spread it. Well, I don't want anybody coming into recovery church and feeling indifferent. You know, I'm going to be up front teaching and away from people. I'll take my mask off during that time, and I'm going to be plenty of enough feet away from everyone. But you know what? I've learned in this whole thing that we need to love each other. I have been learning that a lot. That's one way that I think it, a person in recovery, so no matter what our sin or addiction was, to make amends, that's why God wants us to love each other. Because when we're not loving each other, you know what we're doing? We're building an H step up in our life. We're adding more to the list. I love what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 31. He said, do to others as you would have them do to you. You know, my father used to, it was one, my dad had all these sayings and, you know, he used to say, kid, treat other people the way that you wanted to be treated. Where did he get that from? Right from the word of God. It's amazing that how many good seeds that people probably tried to plant in our lives. And we need to be grateful because after a while, a planted seed will come to bloom. In, in some cases, in most cases. Some of it grows a little slower in the soil of an addict, but sooner or later it comes up and it makes sense. You know, besides do to others as you would have them do to you, I learned to use a slogan called WWJD. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus wouldn't be out there doing things to add to an eighth step than having to do a ninth step. He was about loving people. He was about caring for people. We, we can get so judgmental in our lives and, and bring harm to people, get opinions of people. You know, and, and I'm, I found out in the short time that I've been around, the last 62 and a half years, I think one thing that, that lacks in society and why we have to end up doing these amends is I think a lot of times we're not good at communicating. We don't want to go to another person if there's an indifference in their life and say, hey, can, can I talk to you for a minute? It's very uncomfortable. A couple people have done that in my life, you know, and I love them for it. But the minute somebody goes to you and starts talking, sometimes some emotions can come into the way. But thank God, 2 Timothy 1.7 says that the spirit that God gives us is not fear, but power and love and a sound mind. We don't need to feed into our emotions. We need to listen to people. 
there is not nothing feels better for me than to be a caring, listening ear for another human being. You know, in this eighth step, there's a big word in there that can be a maker or breaker in our recovery. You know what that word is? And I think we talked about it a little bit last week. I'm going to talk about it again. It's about being willing. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, the prophet Isaiah says this, If you are willing and obedient, see, when we're willing, we're opening ourselves up to, to, to following the lead of God, and I believe obedience comes with that. You know, I think it's a character of a Christian, of, an, of, a, of a willing Christian, or a byproduct is the obedience that we have in our life because we want to please God because we see that what God has done for us. And then in that scripture in verse 19 where Isaiah is talking, it says, you shall eat the good of the land. Think about it. If you're in recovery, you know, or you're going to church and you're being obedient to God and you're willing to the ways of the Lord in your life, think about where your life was at moments of disobedience and where it is now. And how is the quality of your life? See, we're called to be disciples. And the key word in that, out of disciple, or a root word, is discipline. A disciple is always disciplined. An obedient person has discipline in their life. They're willing. They're open-minded. These are core values in recovery. You know? When we become willing in, in our recovery... We, too, eat from the good of the land, like I said. It's a change in our life. So what does it mean to be willing? You know, we can look back at our life when we were caught out in our sins and addictions. And then all of a sudden, we became willing to reach out to God. You know, we became willing. Then I came to recovery and I learned something more about willingness. I remember people telling me, you know, they tell me their sponsorship story, you know, how they, you know, that whole thing where it's like you, you feel like that that kid in grade school and you, you see that girl and you want to ask her to dance or you're a little bit older and it's that first girlfriend and man, and it's like asking somebody to sponsor. And then that person, the sponsor, the person that had knowledge and recovery, had, done, had gone through some step work, had gone through the steps and done some change in their life. And, and it wasn't just the fact that it was the first person that you noticed there. You saw a change in somebody's life. There was a difference in their life. And these guys would turn to them and say, are you willing to go to any length to stay sober? Are you willing to go to any length to stay clean? <clears throat> and today I say, are you willing to go to any length to stay away from sin? You know, we need to examine that. So what does it mean to be willing to go to any length? <coughs> Excuse me. If we're willing to go to any lengths, you know what? There's no room for reservations. Reservations are not good. D. Elliot Trueblood said this. Faith is not belief without proof. <clears throat> but trust without reservation. In the eighth step, we're making a list, and it can cause us to revisit sometimes in our past things like pain, fear, regret, and that list can go on and on if we're allowing ourselves to be emotionally guided in our recovery. But going to any length means willing to do anything and I say to be drawn closer to God. See, if we trust God with the process, we'll know that it's a growth opportunity toward freedom. That's what happens. As we're doing some work on ourselves in recovery and God's changing us, he's pulling all this, these sins and defects off of us. We're not acting out and adding more to that eight-step list in our life. And we're feeling free. If you give God a chance, you're going to experience victory in a way you never have. 
Maybe you've never invited Jesus into your heart to be the Lord of your life. If you ask me, you know, in recovery, they said, how'd you do it? You know what I'd say today? I didn't. He did. Christ did it in me. My hope of glory. You know what? Going to any lengths? Check this out. When we see Jesus in the garden, he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane. We see what we need to do in our eighth step. Jesus knew the pain he was facing, what was going to happen, and what did he do? He prayed. Rule one, pray. We need to have a prayer life, not just when things are going bad. We need to be relational with God. We need to tell Lord, the Lord we're having a great day and thank him for the great day. Then we see in the life of David, the shepherd boy, facing an enemy called Goliath, so great that Israel's army was shaking in their boots over one person. David knew that God he could be trusted. He trusted God. Rule two, trust God in the good times and the bad times, all the times, because God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, right? God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. I see it also in the life of a man named Saul of Tarsus, going on a murderous spree, rounding up Christians. He has an encounter with the Lord, and his life is changed forever. Rule three, let God change you. God's brought you to where you're at right now, and there's a reason and the purpose. It's when I start to think that I'm all fixed and I'm all good and I'm all perfect. Wow. Watch out. It's the hammer rule. My butt, I had a buddy and he, and he, and he talked about it. He, he, he would, him and I work together. You know, we work construction in the carpenters union and he's a great guy. And um, he said, you know what? I had to stop picking on John because it seemed like, Every time I did something against John, I'd whack my hand on something or I hit myself with a hammer. It was like God was taking care of John and we joke about it. But you know what? I remember times when I was working construction and my ego would get in the way and I whacked myself with a hammer. You know, when, you know, and, and there's a story in that in our own lives, you know, because doing an eight step is about stepping out of the past, not finding out the things that we do that aren't right. So we're not going to go back and do that. So there's a lesson to be learned because there's never a good outcome out of bad thinking or bad behavior. I'm sitting there at work, maybe getting a bad thought about somebody, how I'm so much better, and then whack, ow, the hammer drops. But that's okay. That's part of the learning lessons of life. I believe that God gets our attention, you know? And who are we to say how God's going to get our attention? We look back at the times of the nation of Israel. He sent the Babylonians in there because Israel had strayed. It's a rule, too, in our recovery. If we stray from God, expect everything that can go along with it. I read, a, I read a, an article that, you know... And I, then I talked to somebody that, that's not in recovery, and they were kind of like, man, because, see, they, didn't, they don't understand addicts, you know? And they were like, man, I can't believe how the numbers are still climbing on people overdosing. Active addiction doesn't have an end date just because there's, there's a pandemic. I told somebody a while ago, there was a pandemic going on before this pandemic. You know, I guess the whole point I'm getting at, you know, looking at at, at, at Jesus and, and David and, 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 Paul, and Saul who became Paul, it all comes down to that God wouldn't, he couldn't would if he were sought. You know, that's an old 12-step slogan. 
We need to seek him and we need to and we need to trust him. We need to pray and we need to allow him to change us because with God, all things are possible. When we're on a mode of allowing the Lord to guide us, because we get on modes, we, you know, we get hooked into something. Sometimes we're so big on tunnel vision, you know. But get hooked on something good in your life. When we're, when we're on the mode of allowing the Lord to guide us, when we've, we've seriously surrendered to him, surrendered our lives to him, and we're trusting him, you know, and we turn our will and our life over to his care. He's guiding us. He's directing our lives. We learn how much he truly loves us. That's what I've learned from having a relationship. Not only that he loves us, things at one time that were impossible have become possible because we're trusting him. And the reality is he's doing it through us. It ties, that type of thinking ties right into the step. Because anybody who's done an eighth step will tell you, if they're honest, as they're getting ready to do it and this and that, a million reasons why you shouldn't. It's the same thing we go through, that whole mental piece between the fourth and the fifth step. we got to turn that channel off and trust God. And what's happened, too, is if you're wrestling with this, God's already revealed his power to you. And again, I'm going to say it. We need to trust him. Remember back in the day when you were caught out and hopeless and you felt you had nowhere to go and you threw a prayer up? Did God answer your prayer? Absolutely. If it was a, a prayer of humility. Not those three o'clock in the morning cocaine prayers. They didn't work for me either. But I look at that time where I was really being honest with God. And it was amazing how doors started to open up. I remember back in 1988 being at being at one treatment center, or 87, I'm sorry. And 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 being 88, I'm sorry, being at a treatment center and um being asked to leave because my insurance didn't cover addiction. It covered alcoholism. And so when I went to treatment in the second time, uh, that same day, that same day I was let in to a place called Blue Ridge Treatment Center in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And that's where I started my journey in recovery. I walked in on the 19th of September, 1988. But I say the 20th is my sobriety date because I woke up rough, but I hadn't been drinking or drugging. And um, somebody told me, just drink your way to treatment. I don't recommend that to anyone. But we have to go to any length to stay sober. I remember feeling so rejected when that first treatment center said they couldn't take me. It's amazing when we get at that point of, being powerless and feeling hopeless, that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a prayer gets thrown up. And you know what happened? I found myself at beginning a journey that has radically changed my life. For some people, that prayer might be to a God they don't know. They might, they might have heard of him, but in desperation, they're willing to go into any length. The pain, the degradation, the guilt, the harm, the danger. Those are the things that cause us to go to any length. We're told early on in recovery that willingness is the key. Willingness is the key that opens the door to a new life. God has a plan for you. He's got a life for you. But you got to be willing. You see, for me, staying sober for a while was a good thing. And, and this is my experience in recovery. You know, what happened to me? You know, there was a newness about recovery. I felt good. And then I hit a spiritual wall. There was an emptiness and a void to my life that I tried to fill with so many different things. Hanging out with all my friends in recovery, going to recovery dances, doing this or that. But I wasn't doing anything 
in, in my spirit. I wasn't feeling I got saved when I was a teenager. But you know what? That whole relationship with God is like a bank. We, we deposit stuff into there. And man, the return we get, unbelievable. You see, this is what I believe about the 12 steps. If God's not in it, we're not going to win it. We're not going to change. Our life isn't going to be changed. I want to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 5, verse, starting at verse 17. It's a, it's a story about a man who is paralyzed. But there's some good recovery stuff in here. I want to read um, nine verses or so. And this is what the word of the Lord says in Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So we see one thing that's really important right here. That it's the power of the Lord that's with Jesus. That same power is available for us. We ask Jesus into our heart. We get an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the power of God is upon us. But it's here to heal the sick. Verse 18 says, Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friends, your sins are forgiven. Wow. And the Pharisees and the teacher of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus knew, verse 22, what they were thinking and asked, What are you thinking? Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Watch this immediately. He stood up in front of him, of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. And everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and said, watch this. We have seen remarkable things today. The first thing that I see They knew, these guys that were there, they knew that there was something great in the place. But they didn't stop at the first obstacle. I wanted to give you a biblical perspective towards your recovery. There's going to be times where you're going to think, man, I can't get there. I can't get there. Don't stop at the first obstacle. We hear something, an old slogan in recovery. Don't quit before the miracle happens. You know what? The moment it got tough, they didn't just throw up their hands and quit. It's that going to any length principle. From the outside looking in, Many who aren't in recovery will ask you and I, why do you have to go to those meetings? Anybody ever say that to you? And I'm sure that some of the people present that day thought that about the men carrying the man. Why do you got to go climb up on the roof? You see, because it's about loving another person. It's about going to any length. You see, they had seen the evidence that Jesus healed. And we know in recovery, we see the evidence. 
that with God all things are possible. We see that hopeless addict that everybody wrote off, that never had any hope or any chance for anything in their life, going around where society looked at them as either a junkie, a prostitute, you know, a loser. They did that at them. You'll never amount to anything. And God looks down at them as his creation. He's a loving God. We have a heavenly father. They went to any length to get close to the Lord. And remember this. It doesn't say that they fell down when they were climbing, putting them on the roof or anything. We need to remember one other thing. God was with them. And God's with you in your recovery. You just need to cry out to him and ask him to be the Lord of your life. The second thing that I saw in those nine verses, just because people are around you, they aren't always good for you. Watch the words of the people that are around you and get around people that want to encourage you and build you up. You know, here they are. The Pharisees, you know, here they are again, you know. All this is going on, and they got to pick Jesus apart, you know. We have the type of people with a spirit of religion like these guys that they hurt the Lord more than they help. Hyper-religious, better than anyone else. The ability to tell them what's the right way to do that and what's the wrong way to do that. You know, what I know and I love about recovery and recovery churches, we share our experience, strength, and hope with you. We don't share an opinion. We share things that have worked in our life. And they're just suggestions. You can do whatever you want with them. But pray first before you do something. These guys, they're good and religious. You know, we used to call them recovery Nazis. They were, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. Really? Where's the love? They're so worried about what's happening because it's not being done their way. We've been given this wonderful book, a textbook for life. The acronym for Bible is Basic Instructions Before Living, Leaving Earth. And it's, it's a life manual. It tells us how to live and how to, how to do the right thing in life. But you know what? They did say something in um, they did say something that was right in, in at the end of verse 22. He says, who can forgive sins but God? <laughs> they were right about that because Jesus is God. And the third thing, and I think this is one of the, the most important parts in our recovery after our relationship with the Lord. You can't do this alone, guys. That's the importance of having a, having like a mentor or uh, somebody discipling you or a sponsor in your recovery when you're doing an eight step, somebody who's gone through it, who has experienced strength and hope that can walk you through this stuff. And I talk about it. It's like that backpack that we carry of life. And we go along and put rocks in it. And, and after a while, it just gets so heavy. We allow God into our life and he starts pulling that stuff because he's changing us. He's taking those rocks. We're not that person anymore. And then we allow people to come along and help us. Like the four, the, the four guys that, that, that lower this guy, climb up, that, that are there to love somebody. They didn't have to. But love causes us to do things that some people won't do. You know, we don't have to do this alone. The man without his friends, he couldn't have made it there. We need each other. In recovery, 
It's like the old story of a herd of sheep. You know, don't get caught on the outside because all the wolves are there to pick you off. Allow others to help and carry yourself when you can. Be part of the herd and allow the Lord to heal you. So many times in our past, we trusted people, places, and things that weren't good for us. We need to be careful to not get caught up in not trusting God. Just because somebody's done something, and maybe they said, hey, I went to church. I'm a church-going person, and they've hurt you. Don't blame God for that. Seek God in your life and see what he'll do for you. I have a friend named Harry. He passed away a few years back. It's been a little while now, but he died sober. Harry loved the Lord. I used to go to this place called St. Paul's in Lower Manic. They had meetings, and there was a room up above. And Harry was like 30-some years sober, and he always made coffee. <laughs> and even if some one of the younger guys was making coffee, Harry was always there. And with Harry, you had a meeting before the meeting. And after Harry had, had um, passed away, the community room there, they named it in his honor. Because he had an impact, because they saw the Lord working in him. And, and I know one thing, that Harry loved the Lord. I know where Harry is today. But Harry had a catchphrase, and I want to share that with you. He'd say, I'm sober, and I'm not the reason why. You know? Back on this, this point in, in Luke, can you imagine how his friends felt? Being part of watching somebody being delivered from paralysis, being healed, being made new. That's why I enjoy recovery and recovery church. I enjoy recovery. I enjoy, you know, I made a post on Facebook this week that I, and I, I stand by it. I think the most courageous person in a meeting is the newcomer walking in. And some people liked it because it's a reality. It's a truth. You see, going to any lengths has to be without inhibition or reservations, or we're not going to get anywhere on our recovery. What length are you willing to go in your recovery? Where are you at with the Lord? You know, maybe you you look at God as being something, someone that you learned about when you were young, you know, and you went to church and you were forced maybe by your parents. But look at where you are, that you're clean and sober or free from sin in your life. And maybe... You're like where I was at that point. You like hit that spiritual wall. Do what I did. Roll up your sleeves and get involved in your relationship with the Lord. Time to do a little bit of work. Connect with God on a daily basis. Maybe you never asked him into your heart to be the Lord of your life. It's a real simple prayer. I'm going to recite it right now. And maybe you've never recited this prayer. And it's a starting point. And then get in touch with us at the Recovery Church. If uh, you pray this prayer today, you can go. You can send us a private message. Nobody has to see. But that way we can pray for you and maybe help you with some discipleship. Or maybe if you have a need for sponsorship and recovery, contact us. We're, we're there for you. So it's a real simple prayer. It goes like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died for my sins. I know that you raised them from the dead. I ask Jesus into my heart right now to be the Lord of my life. And if you said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. But it, like I said, it's just a starting point. And we want to be here for you in your recovery to watch you grow. And in the end of verse 26 in this scripture, we see something that reminds us of what happens in recovery on a, on a daily basis. The Bible says, we see remarkable things. They, they said they saw remarkable things there. We have seen remarkable things today. And that's what happens in recovery. That's what happens in a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes we're the only one holding ourselves back from it. You know, and I had a sponsor that told me a long time ago, when the pain's great enough, you'll change. 
It's time to surrender and give it all to God and have a good night. I want to pray, and then I'm going to do one more quick song, and we'll call it a night. So, Lord, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you that, Lord, you you uh, reveal yourself in us. Give us the ability to go to any length to say sober, God, that you're with us, that you desire to have relationships with people. Thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, a few years ago, I wrote a song about step work. <laughs> it's about recovery, but it's about going through pain because when we're doing some of the step work, man, we can have some emotional pain. But you know what? We get to the other side. We don't. God does. God gets us through it. I want to tell you, I love all you guys. Have a good night. Ain't no easy journey. No smooth trip down the road. No peaceful quest along the path.
real nice. Gotta get low to get right. God bless you all. Love you all. Have a good night.